Chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. Uh, this morning we come to that place in this epistle that we've been studying that God has given this church and ministry about. I want to begin reading at verse 35, chapter 10. Read through verse 6 of chapter 11, then uh, just be discussing it. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. <clears throat> For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he shall come, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now notice verse 38, the just shall live by faith. He didn't say you get saved by faith, but you, that's a part of the life. But we live by faith. And if any man draw back, whether it's salvation or draw back on any of his promises, then he says, my soul, God says, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were created by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it he being dead yet speaketh, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. <clears throat> For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, if you want to know how to please God, the next verse tells you. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. <clears throat> so I want to bring, I don't know how many messages, uh, one, two, three, or half a dozen on chapter 11. Uh, and today I want to deal with some principles that are basic and some that may be familiar to some of you, but there are people here, a lot of people, that they may not be grounded in these basic principles of faith. And if you are, then this will give you an opportunity to drive the nails in. Uh, if you want to know what we mean by driving the nails in, when I was up in Minnesota a few years ago, we teaching there for about a week. There was a woman that uh, a woman and her husband came in, and uh, I said, "Well, praise the Lord, good to see you up here. But you'll probably be hearing some of the same faith principles I taught down in your city. We've been teaching there for actually altogether three and a half years." And she said, "Well, praise God, that's all right. I need to hear them again." And uh, I know I do, so I appreciated what she said. But that night, God gave her a vision, and she told us about it the next day, and said that, that when you said that uh, you'd probably be hearing some of the same faith principles that I had heard, and I said, that's all right. She said, God gave me a vision, I saw this tree house. And it was all lopsided and half built, you know, like the little boys build. And uh, the nails half driven in and all, and she said, that God pointed to that and said, now that's your faith the first time you heard him teach these principles, and now that you're going to hear them again, you can drive the nails in. Hallelujah. So <clears throat> uh, don't sit down on me out there if you've uh, heard me preach on Hebrews 11, 1 to 6 before, because this will give you an opportunity to drive the nails in. Amen. Hallelujah. Understanding faith is what I want to speak about this morning. Now... The importance of faith to the epistle of Hebrews that we're studying, which of course you know that I entitled Out of the Shadows into the Light, that we have a better promises based on a better covenant and everything is better for us, that if the Old Testament saints had all of those blessings like healing and prosperity and protection, deliverance, and so on, and that was but a shadow of better things to come, then at least we ought to claim that much. We ought to begin there. And... Uh, <clears throat> The importance of faith to this epistle, it seems you've got a whole chapter, 40 verses, devoted to one subject, faith. That's all he talks about in this chapter. In fact, he begins way back in chapter 10 and goes through part of 12. 
But the importance of faith to God is seen in verse 6 because, well, he tells us two things here. We've got two facts set forth. That without it, you can't please him. Uh, we just have to settle on that. There are a lot of things that we must do and believe to please God, but we know of one thing that we have to have and exercise, and that's faith. So our brother said, in effect, in his sermonette, uh, that's what a short one is, <laughs> that faith without works is dead. That's really what he was saying. And uh, you, uh, it's between uh, the individual and the Lord how he works out his faith. Um, but it must be put into practice, to be sure. And that's one of the ways, Matthew 25. Uh, but faith itself is an absolute essential to ever pleasing God. It doesn't matter if you did go to the prisons or if you did give your life uh, for someone, uh, uh, rescue someone from drowning and drown yourself. It wouldn't matter what you do. He says without faith in those deeds or acts, then you can't please him. Amen. Amen. Because Romans 14.23 says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So it's the doing and the believing. It's not just the believing without the doing, but it isn't the doing without the believing. But <clears throat> you don't have to search around the Bible to find out how to please God in this area because he tells you without this, with this, this believing, then you can't please him. But he doesn't stop there. He defines faith. That is the application of faith because he says it's two things. First of all, it's believing that there is a God who exists that will hear you. If you call on him, let's think in terms of prayer and, and asking him to fulfill a promise. You've got to first of all believe there's a God there that will hear prayer. For he that cometh to God must believe that he exists. There's your application of faith. But he doesn't stop there. And the second thing you've got to believe is that he answers your prayers when you use your faith and ask him. Because he says you must believe he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Whatever you're seeking him about. See, these are faith principles. Because uh, there may be a stress on salvation in a passage or something of this nature, a stress on healing or protection or deliverance or material prosperity. Any principle dealing with one thing can be applied to another. And so uh, we've got churches full of people who believe the former thing here, that uh, God exists. But I'll tell you, their hearts are filled, most of them, with doubt as to whether or not God will do the other thing, reward those who diligently seek him. That's what we call doubt and unbelief and skepticism and uh, erroneous uh, belief and all of that. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's just as grave a sin in the sight of God to doubt his word as to doubt his existence. He didn't say that all he required of you was to believe that he exists, but you have to believe he will answer your prayers, that he will reward those who believe that he exists. So it's just as great a sin. And I want to stress that, and I hope, and I hope that every one of us, from the greatest to the least in the area of faith, I got a letter <clears throat> just yesterday that said, we've come to full faith. Well, praise God. Uh, there is such a thing as coming to full faith. So we've got full faith and we believe the whole church is going to have it, including the pastor. But I want everybody to get it here who's full of faith or who's still on the barter of uh, trying to figure out whether or not God will do all that he says and whether or not healing and material provision and all of these promises are valid for today. Wherever you are in your thinking, we've got to get a hold of the truth that it's just as great a sin to doubt God's word as to doubt his existence. Amen. And that's what he says here. In fact, he says that all through the scripture. Uh, uh, that it isn't enough just to say, I believe God exists. What well, churches are full of people who say they believe in God, but they're not believing God beyond that. And they may be in for a rude awakening one of these days to discover that the basic concern of God, one of the basic concerns was that they attempt to please him by believing his word, claiming it and believing it, and believing that he'll reward them, reward those who diligently seek him. And so faith is a basic concern of God because it's the only way into his presence, the only way to fulfill his will in your life. It's the only way to, uh, to receive his promises and to 
fulfill the commission that he's left the church. That's why the church today is so ineffective. God has called every one of us uh, not just to believe for essential needs, but to a walk of faith. And I'm going to be very bold and say that he's called every one of you to a life of total, absolute trust in everything from your health, life, material prosperity, whether it's in the face of accident, broken bones, threat of bankruptcy, the salvation of your family, uh, cancer, whatever it is, he wants you to go right down to the last, last breath, last penny, last moment, the last of everything with your hand in his and saying that if God won't keep his word, then I'd just soon die this way. I'd rather die believing than doubting. I'd rather lose the business than doubt him. And so this is, when, when you hear us talking about the overcoming message, this is what we're talking about, friends. God expects, you have to begin here. Here's where Christians miss God by 10,000 miles. Every Christian, except those few that you know, that are the exception. And most of them are probably here. <laughs> God expects us to go all the way. There's just no exception. Now, of course, we don't want to discourage you, but after all, we've been preaching faith uh, at least eight years charismatically and teaching it and preaching it and living it for 22 years. So <clears throat> while God is patient with the weak, <clears throat> Jesus never quenched a smoking flax. It is said of him, he'll not quench a smoking flax. Wherever he finds a spark of life or interest or faith, why he'll fan it into a flame. But, but uh, there, there comes a time when there's no longer any time for you. Uh, God can only endure our unbelief and doubts and questions and, oh, whatever it is that keeps you from going all the way of God, with God, he can only endure that for so long and he's going to have to move on and use people or a person that will believe him. Uh, all the way. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Now, he tells us what it is. He says, faith is the very substance of whatever you're praying for. It's the evidence of things you can't see. It's in another realm entirely. Substance, it is a substance. One woman said to me, I was praying about this, hearing you teach on this, and I couldn't quite get clear uh, what it meant when you said faith is the very substance of what you're praying for. It is the answer. It's just in the invisible form. And she said, God, <clears throat> I don't remember whether he said, she said he gave me a vision or spoke to me, one or the other, and said, well, it's just like a potter want, wanting to make a vessel. He said, if I were a potter and wanted to make a vessel, I'd need some clay to make it out of. And he said, your faith is the clay. You've got to give me something to make the answer out of. He said, it's just like a potter needing clay to make a vessel. If you want an answer to prayer, then you've got to give me some of that substance. You've got to just keep on getting in the word, friends, so you get a hold of some of that substance Amen. that you need that uh, God can produce the answer out of. It is a real substance. Because you can't see it doesn't mean it's any less real. In fact, reality is the invisible. It's not the visible. Uh, this world, I don't mean that it isn't real, but this isn't the real. The spiritual dimension is the real. Amen. This has been created. The spiritual dimension hasn't been. That's God. And we have to begin to think in terms other than feeling and smelling and hearing and taste and touch and weighing and measuring and analyzing and reasoning things out. And just simply say, because God says that such and such is so, then that's sufficient for me and I choose to believe it. And those who do that find out that they're, they're giving God a substance, as it were, some dynamic power by which he can take the substance you're presenting him and produce the answer out of it. And all the answers to prayer always exist in two forms, the faith form, which is invisible, and the later manifestation, which is a visible form. And until we give God some of this substance, uh, some of this believing, as it were, something that will push the button and get the things to moving and operating, then God cannot give us an answer because it's just like a potter with clay. You've got to have the clay. Over in chapter uh, 1 and verse 3, 
Uh, this same word substance is used, but it's translated here image. It speaks of Christ, who is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. And I've often used the example how that, uh, that's a good translation, although the word literally uh, is substance in the Greek. But the image is a good translation because it is what is actually said in Hebrews 1, 3, that Christ is the exact substance of God. Whatever God is, Christ is the duplicate or the exact same, exactly same nature as that. And the idea there of image is a good translation because it's like looking in a mirror. The only reason you can have an image of your face, a reflection, is because the real substance is there. And so when you put image over here in Hebrews 11.1, 1, then you end up with faith is the very image of the thing you're praying for. And you can't have faith for a thing that doesn't exist. You can't have the reflection in a mirror, an image of something reflecting back to you if it isn't there. I mean, the very fact that you can believe it based on the Word of God means that the answer already exists. Amen. And so we should never say to God, well, it's been six months and I guess it just doesn't work for this or I must not be healed because I don't feel any better. It's been three or four days. In fact, I feel worse. Or uh, the money, uh, maybe I'm not going to get it because I don't see it yet. This has nothing to do with the fact that you possess it in the faith realm. Because if you can believe for it, and that's the big question, if you can believe for it, then it exists by virtue of the fact that you're believing it. Now, again, don't misquote what Brother Freeman said. I said it has to be based on the Word of God. You can believe there are three moons going around the earth. It won't change the fact there's only one. Uh, we're talking about believing for something based upon reality. Well, we're going to believe for either that thing getting fixed or getting a better one. <laughs> Since we believe in the abundant life, that isn't the best system. I think it's done pretty good for $125. <laughs> you couldn't even buy a good radio for that anymore. But <clears throat> I probably, some of you remember me telling you about the Methodist pastor's wife who heard me, heard me teaching on faith and how that it's a reflection uh, as you look in a mirror, you know, as you look in a mirror, you see the reflection of your face. And she took a mirror. I went back a year later in that town to teach, and she told me she had done this. She taught uh, some children, six, seven, eight years old. She said, I took a mirror, you know, about that size, and said there was a shelf in the back of the Sunday school room, and I put some apples there, and they didn't see me put them there. And then as I was teaching them what faith is, it's the very substance out of which the answer is made. It is the answer. You just don't see it yet. You have to take it by faith. Because God said faith is the answer. That's what he said there. Faith is the answer. And then I told them how, as you pointed out, that it's like looking in a mirror. The only reason you can see a reflection is that you're there. The answer's there, you see. You couldn't, have, you couldn't see the answer by faith unless it existed. Oh, you could hope and wish and all that. And then she said, I, after teaching that, I passed the mirror around and said, now, I want you to look in it and look to the back of the room and whatever you see back there and believe us there. Don't turn around. Uh, you can have it. <laughs> well, it wasn't long until, you know, that when I'm spotted, I see apples. She said, no, you don't see apples. I said, you see the substance of apples. You see the image of apples. But because you believe there are apples there, you get the apples. <laughs> he couldn't have eaten those apples. <laughs> Well, they got the message right away. I hope you do this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord that, that those apples were real because he believed it. But he could never eat those. He had to take those by faith and believe they were there. And that's just the way your faith is. When you claim the $5,000 you need to pay off the note, and God has said over and over in his word that he's willing to give you that and ten times that much if you need it, uh, or if it's healing or the salvation or deliverance of someone you love, uh, whatever the need is, the requirement is, he said, if you'll see it by faith, that faith will be the very substance of the thing that you're hoping for, uh, that you're praying for. Then he says, it's, it's evidence of what you can't see. Don't look for evidence in the visible realm. He says, faith is evidence of things you can't see. 
uh, evidence of anything is absolute proof of its existence. You can't have evidence of something that isn't true. In courts of law, they convict men or women on the basis of evidence. If a man robs a druggist and... Uh, uh, the druggist is sitting in the courtroom and he's being questioned and the man that they think is guilty, uh, if uh, the prosecutor asks him, is that the man that robbed you? And he says, well, it looks like him. I think it is. Now that isn't evidence. And he may or may not be convicted on that. That's hope, supposition. He's just hoping that's him. But if they <clears throat> caught that man outside the drugstore, and had three witnesses who saw him holding a gun on the druggist, and they've got that man's fingerprints all over the cash drawer, and if his pockets were stuffed with money when they caught him, I'd say that's enough evidence to convict him. Now that's what your faith is. It's the very evidence that God has heard already from his side answered your prayer, because you couldn't believe it if God had not already answered it in the faith realm, in the visible realm, whether or not he manifested in a month or a minute or a year or in case, a case like Abraham, 25 years, or in a case like the children of Israel, seven days later when they marched around Jericho and said, you have the answer if you believe it. Uh, whatever the manifestation time, uh, whatever's involved there has nothing to do with the fact he says, if you can believe it, if you believe I'll do what I've said, he said that faith in your heart is your evidence that you already have the answer. Now, Christians sometimes will say, uh, well, how, how do I know I have it if I don't see it or I don't feel it or if I, the symptoms don't change? And some people say, well, you know, that's just mental suggestion and so forth. But how can I believe I have something that I don't see? And the answer should be obvious that if you could see it, then you couldn't receive it because you've already got it. And if you could see it and already have it, what are you praying about? And if you could see it, even if it was off in the sky somewhere, which it isn't, <laughs> but if it were, uh, then it wouldn't take any faith. And God has established the whole system down here of our getting saved and fulfilling the commission and having his will done in our lives. He's, he's ordained this whole system on the basis of faith. And the reason is that he will not touch us nor allow us to come into his presence in the other way, because we are sinners. We are cut off from God. We are alienated from God, you see. That's our past. And when you come into Christ, then he deals with you in Christ. How did you come to God? Through Christ by faith. The only way you can come to God, whether it's healing or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, deliverance or meeting any need you've got, is the same way. It has to be by faith. It's always approach God by faith. All things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. You see, the believing is a condition to receiving. And so if you could see the answer, then it wouldn't take faith, then you couldn't get the answer from God because the only way you can get an answer from God, uh, whether it's salvation or anything else, is by faith. Now, God has, has so ordained it that he is pleased to honor faith. He says, you please me when you believe me. There's nothing else we can do, friends, to please God except believe him. Now, believing has legs on it. You know, it acts, it walks. Your prayers sometimes have to be walked out and that sort of thing, as we heard this morning. But the believing has to get the feet started moving in the right direction. And so you're not going to please God by just doing something. You're going to please God because you want to do that. And you're doing it by faith. And I want to recommend that none of you go to the prison unless you want to. I mean, uh, don't put any money in the offering unless you want to. Don't even come unless you want to. Well, now you say, I already knew that. Well, of course you did. But it needs, we need to be reminded of the fact that it isn't enough just to do something. We've got to believe it. We've got to be believing in what we're doing. And when you believe in what you're doing, it may not always be the easiest thing you do or the most pleasant task, uh, but, but you can do it because you like to. I do a lot of things that are hard, but I do them because I like to do them. You know, it's, it's like preparing a sermon. That's the hardest work I've ever done. Anybody have a ditch they want dug? I'll trade places as far as the work. Now, I wouldn't. I'm only speaking theoretically. <laughs> I, I wouldn't trade the privilege for anything, but it's much easier to build a house or dig a ditch than to get into the Word and dig it out and to pray over it and prepare it 
And, uh, oh, it's, it's even work if you read your sermons. And we're not reading any sermons. Praise the Lord. But the point being, dear friends, that faith is the key. Faith is the way. Faith is the evidence of what you can't see. Don't ever try to approach God with your senses or with your sight. You'll never get anything from God. You won't even get saved that way. Did anybody ever see God to get saved? Oh, you know of some exceptions, so don't bring that up, where God, I know of a case in South America where he walked into the mental institution, saved him, delivered him from his mental, spirit of mental illness, baptized him, the spirit didn't even ask if he wanted it. But those things, of course, are exceptions which only prove the rule. But no one ever had to see a vision of God before they believed. Well, how do you know he's there? You say, well, I know it in here. Well, that's the same way with all of his promises, friends. Uh, you, you're using this kind of faith all the time. You're using it this morning as you're breathing. You don't see any oxygen in here, but you're breathing it. You're believing it. It's there. Every, every second or so, no one's carried their oxygen tank along with them or mask. You believe it. No one gets out and looks at a, a cloudy day and... Uh, and says, well, I'm not going to believe it till it starts falling. You hear people all the time saying it's going to rain. Well, how do they know it's going to rain? How do they know there's anything up there? They can't see it. It'll never rain until the combination of invisible factors get together in the right proportion. You can't see hydrogen or oxygen, but I have, everybody believes in water. You have to get them in the right proportions before that which they say, I know is there, that will come down, will come down. And they're believing in invisible things all the time. This is just the way it is, just like this morning. Uh, I could tell you all the mechanics of how this works. I know uh, something about electronics, but we're all taking the faith, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, just turn that off because I can't see electricity. I believe it's in those wires and going out there, and so because I can't see it, I'm not going to do a lot of, like a lot of Christians say, I'm not going to believe it because I don't see it. Or how do I know I'm healed? I don't feel any better. You see, you don't see any of this. It's just the sound waves from my voice being translated by this microphone, a little diaphragm in there, a magnetic diaphragm, that when I talk, the air waves are, <clears throat> are translated into electronic impulses. Uh, I mean, my voice isn't going over that wire. You couldn't get anybody. You can't get sound over that wire. But that's just electricity. As soon as I talk, that magnet starts working. Now, this thing we piddle with down here is, <laughs> is just an amplifier. It doesn't do anything except makes this voice loud enough out there that you can hear it. But the, the secret is the thing you can't see, and you have to take the faith are those electronic impulses, the uh, electrons flowing through the wire. You call it electricity. When it gets over there to what you call speakers, the, the, the speaker is just a duplication of my vocal cords. It's a throat. That's what it is. And the, the exact duplication of what's happening on this diaphragm is being repeated over there, except that's a great big one. Now, if you take the cover off of the speaker, you could see the throat working. That's what a speaker is. It, and it's retranslating electrical impulses back into, into sound, you see because that thing vibrates, and uh, there's really not a voice up there, it's just that speaker going back and forth, duplicating this. Well, now you've got a free lesson in electronics. <laughs> but we're all believing it. Amen. Now, who's ever seen electricity? And yet every one of you sit here and believe that it's there. All I have to do is throw a button or throw it off, you see. And so we're, we're, we're dealing, we're living in this kind of a world. We're driving over bridges that we believe hold us up. We don't get out and analyze them, say, well, oh my God. <laughs> faith, faith, using faith all the time. You believe when you close the refrigerator, the light goes out. Always, <laughs> always exercising faith. Has anyone ever, dri anyone ever drilled a hole in the back of the refrigerator to see if the light went out? <laughs> well, how do you know that it does? I mean, just how do you know? You Oh, well, I know that. I believe it. You don't really know it, but you believe it, you see. But here's something you can know, because whatever God has said has to be true. Amen. And if you, take, if you will take by faith the fact that the, the light goes out in the refrigerator and you don't really know it, you've got only a man's word. You don't really know. You'd have to be in there to see. <laughs> That's actually true. But here's a word that can't be broken. 
Amen. And when God said, march around the walls of Jericho seven days and they'll fall down, if you'll just obey me, they took it by faith. Now that had never happened before in history. And I'm sure, I'm sure if they were like some Christians I know, there were some skeptics in the crowd, but they weren't in the majority, you see. <clears throat> and so the walls fell down because there were enough people there believing God that they would happen. I'm sure there are always some people saying, now how can that be? Just, just marching around here. Don't take a sword out of your sheath. Don't raise a spear. Don't make a sound. Don't even talk. Seven days, seventh day, march around seven times. And when God gives the word, everybody give a shout and the walls will come tumbling down. Well, I know there were some that didn't believe it because I've been in a seminary. I was taught by professors who didn't believe it happened after it already has taken place. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but... As long as there's somebody there believing it, I believe it would have happened as long as there were sufficient there to believe it. Amen. And Noah, we're told here, he believed that it was going to rain 120 years. He preached without rain. He said it's going to rain. It's not only going to rain, but it's going to be a great rainstorm. Why, the whole chapter, 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews is dealing with this kind of faith. And yet here's where Christians have the most trouble if they can't see it, feel it, weigh it, measure and touch it. And some of you, dear friends, I'm talking to. I really am talking to some of you because everything's all right until a time of a trial. And then when the trial's there, you go by the sense evidence again. Feeling, sight, taste, and touch. And whether or not the money has come yet. Uh, it's the 30th. It's the deadline. Whatever it is, you see. And uh, oh, we shout and we say amen when Brother Freeman preaches faith, but in time of testing. Your faith's no better than, uh, than its strength in time of a trial. Amen. When you look at the impossible and say, I refuse to believe that, I'm going to choose to believe the word of God. There isn't a word in the Bible that says faith is seeing anything. Amen. On the contrary, we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Faith is not seeing anything. When the, the thing that you're believing for comes into existence, there's no faith in operation for that. It's utterly impossible to believe when you see the thing. That's sight. Now in heaven we'll not need faith because we'll look upon the Son of God face to face. We'll know as we're known. We'll see him. We won't have to believe that what we're told about in this book is true about him in the sense that uh, just take it by faith in the invisible. Well, there will be before our eyes, but now we have to walk by faith. Amen. Then it's going to be sight, and when it's sight, it's going to be blessed, but now we're blessing God by faith. Amen. That's right. This is the only way you can please him is to believe that Amen. he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It's just like when I had the heart condition. I had uh, the heart attack back in 66, just prior to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then I received the baptism, and I got into the Word, and the Holy Spirit is the best illuminator of truth that I know of because the same passages that I was teaching or had taught in the seminary was not valid for today, that the healing was not in the atonement. I, had, I could actually prove it from the Word of God, and I always say it's amazing what you can prove without the Holy Spirit from the Word of God. Uh, but I was proving that healing was not in the atonement, and I had the most logical arguments, better than some I've heard since I've gotten the baptism. <laughs> but I don't care to share my negative arguments. Some of the skeptics may pick it up, but <clears throat> <laughs> as soon as I received the Holy Spirit, your eyes are opened, and you can see it's just there. You're no longer a skeptic. You don't care what the Baptists or the Lutherans have said about it. There's what God said. Amen. And so <clears throat> I claimed my healing, as a result, I was healed, but it was a process. And I was down to 158 pounds, and I still had symptoms after claiming my healing. I mean, I did for several months. But I learned almost from the beginning, dear friends, that you don't go by what you see or feel. Amen. When you're dealing in the faith realm, when you're dealing with the promises of God, you go by what he says. And I've been walking for 14 years by faith for material means. Uh, my eyes were were veiled to many of these other promises uh, prior to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But in uh, being in desperate straits in 1952, I decided to believe God, Matthew 6:33, that if I seek only the kingdom of God, that he would take care of all of my material needs. Well, he'd been doing it. Gave me the house I'm living in now and that sort of thing. You know, I just, I just took for granted he would do that. 
And so <clears throat> I'd already been walking by faith, and I knew that many, many, many times the money had not come by the deadline, but his word said I had it, and so I believed it. I held on, I held on when others were giving up. I, uh, even when we sold a house once, and we claimed twice what we paid for it. God gave us a house, and then we sold it for twice what we didn't pay for it. But what, uh, <laughs> what, what the market value of it was, we doubled it, and the realtor was ready to give up. Couldn't even get anybody to look at it. I said, just hold on. God is faithful. He wants us over there. And we had found, in fact, we bought the place in Claypool by faith before we closed the deal on the other. And at the last minute, they were backing out on that, even after she found the buyer. Uh, trouble. I said, don't worry about it. The deal will go through. I mean, you've got nothing to lose to trust God. And it, it did just exactly what we said. In fact, she said at the beginning, you'll never get that price for that house. I said, well, we will because we've already claimed it. But after the whole thing was over, she sat in the bank, the realtor, and said, I just want to, I just want to commend you and your wife. I have never seen a demonstration of faith like this before. Uh, she said, it's a real encouragement that you just held on, believing God answers prayer. Said, there, it's all worked out. Well, she was nervous through the whole thing. And we didn't have to be because we had our faith. Hallelujah. So I knew that God, you see, went by what he said and not what the circumstances indicated. So with the heart, I didn't feel right. I didn't look so hot. And uh, I didn't have to go for that, praise the Lord. I wonder what he said. But the beautiful part was I had a choice. I had the choice of believing what he said or what I saw or what I felt. I want to share with you that that blessing this morning, friends, that you have a choice. You can choose to believe the circumstances. You can believe the Word of God. You've got nothing to lose, everything to gain to believe the Word of God. And if you believe the Word of God and confess it, then what He says will eventually displace whatever contradicts it. Because nothing can ultimately contradict the Word of God. It has to give way. You can't have a yes and no at the same time. And if God has said something, if he said, by my stripes you were healed at Calvary, and you choose to believe that and hold to it, then every symptom, everything that contradicts it, every weakness, every lack of perfect health, whatever you're claiming and believing for, will eventually be displaced by his word. His word will come true in your life. Sometimes it's in a moment. We call those instantaneous answers or healings. Uh, really they're not, they're always after you pray, but the point is that if it's in a moment, uh, sometimes it happens that way, but many, many times it isn't. And over the period of months, I kept confessing what God said. I refused to look in the mirror. Of course, you have to when you shave, but I said, in fact, I used to say, Lord, uh, I got to feeling better before I got to looking better. I said, Lord, I'd sure appreciate it when I start looking as good as I feel. But I kept on confessing the word of God, and in, over a period of months, here was my condition, way down here. His word said ought to be up here. That's the way you ought to feel and look. That's what it said. I kept confessing it, and I found that more and more over the months, the way I felt and the way I looked came to be in harmony with what he said. Amen. Praise God. About that condition. Hallelujah. And the point is that you finally get to the place where you see that it doesn't matter how you feel, that you're healed, regardless of what you see or what you feel, if God says it. Amen. You see, I'm healed whether or not anyone else thinks so or not. Amen. I'm healed. I would be healed if all the doctor's reports, if I was foolish enough to ask some people to go get an examination. <laughs> I, always, I always just kind of hold my breath when somebody says, well, I know I'm healed. Now I'm going to go have an exploratory <laughs> examination or operation just to prove it. So I'll have a testimony. Well, sometimes... Uh, it's all right in one sense if you've got the faith to stand up under what the x-rays say. Because sometimes the x-rays will show the bone still broken. Sometimes the x-ray will show the growth still there. I know of a case, I know of more than one case, I know of one case where they were prayed for, went on, had the operation, and took out a dead malignant tumor. It would have passed from the body if they'd have left it alone. Because it was killed when it was prayed for. But the x-ray showed it's still there. You see. Oh, friends, this, this is no isolated instance I'm talking about. Too many people are giving up uh, uh, too soon because they're going by feelings or what Job's friends say or what the medical reports say. 
Uh, I've said it and I'll continue to say it. I'm not trying to teach babies this morning. I'm going to say the best place to stay away from if you're sick is the hospital. And if you're going through a trial, you don't want examinations. You don't want to find out what it is. Uh, you really don't. Because that has nothing to do with what God says. And uh, I don't want anybody probing and picking and punching and cutting on me to find out if there's something wrong with me. Uh, I've hurt in places, friends, where I can imagine all sorts of things. I've had those, I've had pains right around there. Well, you see, it, uh, my confession is indigestion, hamburgers and onions. <laughs> Why should I confess it's a heart problem again? And the first thing many people do is say, well, I guess I've got the old symptoms back. guess I've got the old condition back. And they have because the devil uses your confession, just like God uses your confession. Give God a positive confession, he'll bless you. Make a negative confession, the devil has his little imps around just recording every word you say, <laughs> waiting to take advantage of it. And so eventually what you say, if it's based on the word of God, will displace or replace whatever contradicts it. I hope you can see that, that nothing can contradict the word of God. Paul says in Romans 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God. If we're in Christ, he says we're in Christ. Nothing can separate us. Absolutely nothing. Well, that's just one of the thousands of promises that God has made you. Nothing can separate you from the word of God if it will uh, if you will claim it and confess it and hold fast to it. And I recommend to you that you just start believing the Word of God all the way. Now some people say, you know, well, I don't have the answer because, well, it's been six weeks, it's been eight months, it's been three days. It depends on, you know, what it is and where they are and their thinking. The deadline is passed. I know of cases where the deadline has been passed, in one case, 33 days. Man, man stood the chance of losing a quarter of a million dollars. 33 days over the deadline. But he wouldn't give up on the word. Held to the word. And God would just keep changing the circumstances. Where they could have foreclosed and taken everything he had, he just kept confessing the word. And the word came true. 33 days beyond the deadline. Deadlines don't mean anything to God. God never said anything in his word. I've walked for 22 years believing him for material blessings. And I said before many, 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 many times the deadline passed when I needed the money. The 30th came or the 21st or whenever it was due. You know, uh, there are times when I didn't have a penny in my pocket or a crust of bread in the cupboard, but we never missed a meal. Now, I used to eat three times a day then. I'm down to twice now, but that's why we ate three times a day. I eat twice now because that's all I need, but uh, praise God, he never failed. And uh, if the money wasn't there by what man said is the deadline, then I simply told them, I'm a Christian, you'll get it. They always did. Hallelujah. God never fails. Oh, you're obligated to let people know the money's on the way because you're believing for it. Don't sit back and not uh, uh, pay what you owe or something of this nature. But the point is that time has nothing to do with it because God isn't involved in time. He created time for us. He said, Mark 11, 24, I want you to get involved in my eternalness when you pray. You're down here where you're involved in time. You have to have time because this is the way he's created uh, the earth and its relation to the sun and all of that. And anyway, that's all time is, is the revolution of the earth in relation to the sun. What we call time, what you call a day, is just the earth turning once. Well, God isn't down here turning with the earth. He's up there above it all. And he created time for us so we could get here on time. You know, 10 o'clock, start on time, didn't he? And uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. We need time. It would be terrible not to know what a, when a three-minute egg was done. <laughs> if you want a three-minute egg, you need something that tells you three minutes is up. But God is not involved in time. When he created this world, he created time with it. Or we could say the universe, he created time with it. But he's the eternal one. He has no beginning or no end. He is pure spirit. And, and he says, I want you to get involved in my eternalness or my eternal now when you pray. Mark eleven twenty four. When What things soever you desire, when you pray... Now you believe that it's already received. Then he says you shall have it. Now that shall have is our time, but that believing we have received is God's eternalness. He says when you pray, if you believe I've answered you, you have it. 
But anybody who can read can see there's two tenses in Mark 11, 24. Believe you have received and you shall have it, a past and a future, or at least a present and a future, believing you have received. And certainly God isn't going to contradict himself, so what he's saying is that if you believe you receive it from my side, my word makes it so. You've already received it. Amen. From your side, there are a lot of circumstances. Maybe I want to save 12 other people through that wife you've claimed for salvation. Maybe I want to save six other uh, relatives or neighbors through that husband that you've claimed is delivered from drugs or alcohol or that child or whatever. And you let me work out the time and the circumstances, but you believe they are saved when you pray. You believe you have received. He said, I'll work it out. Uh, don't get in God's way and mess up uh, with our time, his eternalness, because he's not bound in it. Time is very real to us, as uh, uh, I've uh, sometimes expressed it. Time is like a person riding on the back of a train, the observation car. Now, most of you, many of you at least, probably have never ridden a train because that isn't the way to travel day. That's going to come back, I imagine, with uh, the energy crisis. But uh, if you stand on the rear platform of a train, the Pullman, you know, the, the uh, passenger cars, and as you, uh, the train is always moving, going 60 miles an hour, say, as you look out the side of you, you see things now. That's present tense. But you're moving constantly away from what you just saw, so everything, as soon as you see it, becomes past. That's past tense. You can't see ahead, that's yet future, so you don't know what's coming. And so time's very real to us. You see, things are present now. Now, what I just said is already past. And what I'm going to say isn't happen, hasn't happened, so that's future. But God isn't on the back platform of that train and waiting for things to happen and watching things pass and talking about the present. He's up above it all, sitting on his throne. And when he says you, he's, when he tells us to believe we have received when we pray, he's looking from his side. He's the one that has to answer the prayer anyway, so let's get in his dimension when we pray and believe that we have received. Not we're going to receive, but we believe we have. Uh, early in our charismatic experience when somebody sent us a handkerchief and said, you know, pray over it because we've got a woman up here that's demon-possessed up in Chicago. Well, <laughs> that was kind of new to us, but we saw that in Acts 19, 11, and 12, and we asked the church to pray over the handkerchief, pray for her deliverance. I want to tell you, it didn't happen in a day, didn't happen in a week, didn't happen in two weeks or three weeks, uh, four weeks, and we held on to our faith. And everything was contrary in sense, the sense uh, realm. Everything was contrary to thinking you would get an answer. Because, first of all, we'd never done anything like this. <laughs> Secondly, uh, the longer the time went on, the less likely it would be that would happen. Because the man was so desperate who asked for this that this was his last resort. It was either divorce or the mental institution. She was so bad... Uh, so anti-Christ and anti-God and anti-everything that he said he couldn't take anymore. And someone had been down to our church and said what I said to you a while ago, don't you know you have a choice? See, most people don't even know they have a choice. They just think they have to resign themselves to fate or bad luck or, well, I'm a broken home, I didn't have a chance and all of that. She said, you have a choice. And she said, you can either do that, get rid of your wife, or God will deliver her on your faith that I know a little church that prays the prayer of faith. So to make a long story short, that's what we did. And uh, for 30 days, we sat and we believed God. Now I did, I'm assuming the rest of the church did. I include them in the faith. And the static got pretty loud after two or three weeks from the devil. And he said, you know, you've ruined your ministry before it really got started. This was early in our charismatic experience and we're just starting to preach the faith message, the end time message. And the louder he talked, the louder I shouted, praise the Lord, it's true. And I want to tell you, at the end of 30 days, that's exactly what happened. The man sent word, said, I'm looking at a living miracle. I've never seen a miracle before, but said, as soon as she touched that handkerchief. And you see, he didn't give it to her all that time. We didn't know that. We just had to sit down here and believe God. <laughs> we didn't understand. And a lot of people give up. Uh, because the answer hasn't come and maybe the mail is delayed for some reason, you see. And God is allowing that to mature your faith and to test your faith. At the end of 30 days, she had gotten a hold of it and said as soon as she touched it, every demon went out of her. Free. 
praising God, wants me to take her to church. And several months after that, was down to our church at Claypool, still shouting the victory. She was shouting the victory. Wasn't any of those, you know, have to do it over again. I've heard those stories and so forth and so on. Uh, praise God. Uh, it's true. Circumstances, time, time has nothing to do with it. As soon as we laid our hands on that handkerchief, she was set free. Amen. You see, all the circumstances and conditions have to be right, have to be met. We understand that. We're talking about when they are. We're talking about when they are. We teach the conditions and circumstances and what you have to do to meet all the faith uh, requirements. But we're assuming that this morning, and it was so in this case, that when faith is there, then the answer has already come. When you pray, believe you have received. You see, for people to think they haven't received an answer from God because there's no immediate manifestation of something is to confuse the answer with the manifestation. Now, you've got to keep that in mind. I don't care how much you know about faith. I don't care how long you come to this church and hear faith. People are still missing God. Some of you are still missing God because you forget there's a difference between the answer and the manifestation. The answer comes the moment you believe. God says, believe you have received. Believe you have received. Then you shall have it. That's the manifestation. So what does it matter if it's a moment or a month? From God's side, it's done. No one wants to wait a month. I like to have everything now like you do. You know, we've got... Americans especially have been bitten by the now bug. You've got to have it now. If it isn't now, it's no good. You order a car. It takes 30 days to make it. Oh, I wanted it yesterday. <clears throat> we just live in that kind of a culture, and so we really have to get, <clears throat> get brainwashed uh, out of that concept of thinking we don't have something because it isn't coming soon enough. Why, poor old Abraham, I'm sure he would have missed it. Poor old Caleb, he would have missed it. He waited longer than Abraham, 40 years, he said, have been waiting. He said, 40 years ago, you promised me I could have whatever bit of property that I chose over here in the promised land. Well, he said, that was 40 years ago. He said, it was 40 then, now I'm 80. He said, my strength, he said, I'm as strong as I was when I'm 40. And he said, you just give it to me, Joshua. And he said, I'll go in and take it. He not only believed it, Held on for 40 years, but he acted his faith. And he did take it. You know what he took? Well, he took the choices land in, in, uh, in uh, Israel. And uh, uh, 40 years. Noah, 120 years. Now, I imagine that if any of us had to wait 120 months or 120 weeks, some of us can't wait 120 days. How about 120 hours? You know how long 120 minutes is? Have you heard him? Noah waited 120 years and confessed and believed. It took him that long to build the ark. And he kept telling people, it's going to happen, it's going to rain, it's going to be a flood. <clears throat> he says, you better get right. Uh, nobody believed him. Nobody. The only people in the ark was Mrs. Noah and the three sons and their wives. <laughs> now, how would you like that? He was a failure, wasn't he? You know, many times, friends, you're going to be the only one. You're going to be the only one. Just your family. God will put you in situations and uh, areas sometimes where you'll be the only one. Uh, well, it doesn't mean God doesn't have people you don't know about around, but as far as you know, you're the only one, and you're just going to have to hold on anyway. And if God says 120 years, then it's 120 years that you're going to believe for it. And we're talking about faith. I've had people, like one man said, well, when I gave him Abraham's example, he said, 25 years. Why, he said, I couldn't wait 25 years. Well, I said, forget faith. Then. Because he said, faith has nothing to do with time. Oh, praise God, he isn't going to make you wait 25 years for a healing or for a loved one to be saved or uh, the answer to that financial need or... Whatever it is that you uh, require and you're believing for, uh, generally he isn't going to make you wait 25 years. But thing is, faith will wait. You don't say that I won't wait. You see, from your side, faith says I will wait. Faith has nothing to do with time. I live in a world of time. I'm bound by time. Time is pressing in on me all the time. I go to bed by it. I get up by it. I watch the clock. 
I say I've been praying for an hour. I say I've been preparing this message eight hours in a row. I need a little relaxation. Everything is time. But when you pray, forget time. Just say it's done because God says it. Amen. That's what faith is all about. Faith is the evidence you have received. Amen. 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 Not going to have. <clears throat> now if I came and said you believe you have received, then you could challenge it or question it. That's up to you. But friends, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to put the responsibility on you. God said it. Mark 11, 24. John, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. He said, if you'll pray a prayer that I'll hear, <clears throat> he says, any prayer you pray that's according to my will, he says, I want you to know <clears throat> that you have received your petition. Amen. Again, it's in the past tense. Amen. Now, why then do we say, I believe God exists, but then I turn around and say, it's been six weeks and I don't have the answer yet, so I'm not believing he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It's just as great a sin to doubt God's promise as to doubt his existence. We've got to get a hold of that. Hebrews 11:6. he says, You've got to believe not only that I am, but that I'll do what I said I will do in my word, that I will reward you. <clears throat> well, sometimes people get confused over <clears throat> faith and hope. He speaks here in verse 1 of faith being the very substance of what you're hoping for. And sometimes answers are not coming to prayer. Sometimes... Sometimes you're not receiving what you think you believe for is because you're just hoping, wishing. Sometimes it can be so strong, a desire to see a loved one saved, that you will <clears throat> translate hope and wish as faith. And if it were faith, <clears throat> you'd make that claim. You would claim the promise of God and then you'd rest in the Lord. Faith is a rest. It isn't a work. You'd believe it's done because God has not said here pray and hope. He said pray and believe. All things you ask in prayer believing you shall receive. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell when you're believing and when you're hoping because you can be so emotionally involved in a thing uh, and it be such a, a great desire of your heart you haven't released faith yet. I'm going to tell you there are ways to tell. One is you just quit worrying God about it. When it's faith you just turn it loose. And all you don't cease to pray about it, but you cease asking for it. Amen. There's a big difference. Amen. One brother said the other week, said, I've <clears throat> been trying to teach this message of faith. And he says, uh, I find uh, some people, you know, really resist it. I, yeah, that's right. Uh, you'll get that message uh, before very long. Uh, Christians have been embalmed with unbelief in their churches. It's very hard to get them to believe that, that, <clears throat> that God will do what he says. And uh, he said, you know, I was telling them to believe they have received. Well, I said, you have to go a step further with most people, I've found. You learn these things by experience. And say, uh, and no, he said, what I told them was to pray once. You don't need to pray ten times about the same thing. I said, I found you have to go a step further with most people because they've been taught pray, pray, pray. Prayer, uh, prayer helps. You see it on the signboard, prayer changes things. And uh, they've been taught just to pray around the clock and back and hope something may happen. And I said, uh, you have to go a step further. When you tell them pray once, you tell them what you mean ask once. And to continue to pray until it's manifested, but let your prayers be praise and thanksgiving that God has heard. The answer is on the way. That's prayer. But it's a prayer of thanksgiving and not supplication, not asking. And there's a big difference when you're dealing with the promises of God. We're talking about the promises. Now, I just said the promises at least four times this morning. And uh, I'm, I'm making a point of that because I stressed it the other day in a message. And brother came up after and said, well, now, you know, um, you said you never to pray if it be thy will. I said, yes. And how many times did I say about the promises of God? You see, no. see they don't hear you. They've been taught the wrong things for so long. Some of you, all of us have been taught the wrong things, but some of you have not really heard some of the things I've said this morning. Because, and it's no criticism of you, because we are brainwashed into thinking a stereotyped way. That when I say you don't have to pray but once about a promise, all we hear him say, you don't have to pray but once. And the Bible says men ought to pray always and not to faint. So that's the first thing to think of. But I said about the promises of God. You claim them once. Oh, praise God, when I claim my mother once, 
I said, Lord, I'll never ask you again. I'd been praying for her 14 years. And she wasn't any closer to the kingdom than when I started. <clears throat> but when he showed me that that wasn't faith, I said, I ask you now, in faith, I'll never ask you again. But I want to tell you it was seven, eight, ten months later when the manifestation came. And all that time, I thanked God. I prayed about it. You know, God, you're faithful. <clears throat> Lord, uh, you know, I'd remind him how impossible it was for man to do anything, but it was already done because he said so. <clears throat> this blesses the heart of God. When you rejoice in the fact that he will do what he says and that he's already done it as far as you're concerned, so I said to this brother, you have to tell them this. Because if they were really ready for that message of faith, then they'd know what you mean when you say, ask once for a promise of God. Because if they will come just a whole month in a row, all four Sundays, they will hear you say more than once that you ought to do much praying, you see. Because then you're dealing about prayer. You're talking all the time about interceding in the Spirit and this sort of thing. And how that you pray in tongues, 80% of the time you're praying and this sort of thing. Uh, but they're not hearing that when you made that statement that you ought to ask one time and only pray once. So I'm spending that time because there are several of you, dear friends, out there who didn't hear me say. I'm talking about the promises of God this morning. Now, <clears throat> lest you think that that's just some sideline with God f fulfilling promises occasionally, that's about the only way he ever deals with you. <clears throat> this book is filled with these promises. And this is the way that you approach God and get things done in your life, in the church, and so on. So when we're talking about the promises, we mean that about 95% of the time you're basing all your prayer on the promises of God. That is, with respect to needs and getting things done. <clears throat> there shouldn't be over 5% of your life. Uh, I haven't figured this out mathematically, but there shouldn't be over 5% of your life when you don't know the will of God. You ought to be praying in the will of God. You ought to know what he said. Amen. When brother said, well, <clears throat> when you say pray only once for a promise, that assumes you know what the promise means. I said, that's right. <clears throat> There's no substitute for studying the word of God. Amen. If I read all things, ask in prayer, believing I'll receive, I have to know First John's over there, and I have to put that with it. And he says, you've got to ask according to my will. You see, I can't just ask him all things and say, I want 15 Cadillacs out in front of my house by tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Now, it has to happen because I believe it. It'll never happen. First of all, if nothing else, you set the time on God, and that's one of the conditions you have to know in his word. You don't set the time on God. He tells you when the manifestation comes. He says for you to believe that you have received, then you shall have it. Now, see, I couldn't say it all there in, in that statement because there are times when you can set a time. That's right. <laughs> so that's why you have to keep hearing the word so you know what all of these various facets of faith are, <clears throat> the conditions are. And uh, I'll let you in on a faith secret. If you ever have to ask, can you set a time? No. Because whenever you set a time, it'll happen in such and such a time, you've got the faith for it. It's already happened. I've done it, but it's 1% it's of the praying I've done when I've set a time. 1% out of 99% of claiming something. You rarely set a time, but I'll tell you the times when God wants you to set a time. He wants you to believe us now. When he told Moses to speak and tell the children of Israel to go forward, and they were right at the Red Sea, there wasn't any time to say, well, we'll get a later manifestation. <laughs> that was a believing for now. And I've set the time. The first car I got by faith. The first one I got paid for by faith. I set the time. When everything they said it won't work. Can't happen. It takes 30 days to make it. And that was on a Monday when I said that. I said it would be in front of my house Friday at 3 o'clock. Went everywhere confessing it. The whole family confessed it. The whole church knew it. I'll tell you, that's when it was there, Friday at 3. And I can give you five reasons that they said that it's impossible. Uh, I've either told you that before or I'll tell you some other time. That's quite an involved story, but that, that was setting a time. Now, friends, I wasn't doubting it. I didn't have to call up uh, Kenneth Hagin or uh, Oral Roberts or T.L. Osborne or Derek Prince. See, I was new in this. I just received the baptism when that happened. 
and say, hey, do you think I've done the right thing? Because that's what people do to me constantly. Say, now, I, can I believe for this? And I've got to have it by tomorrow. I've got to have it by Tuesday. Or it's got to happen before this meeting's over. You'll be in a meeting for a week. And I'm, uh, I, I want to believe that my husband is going to be saved while you're here teaching this week. Can I do that? I'll say no, because you just revealed you didn't have the faith for it when you said, can I do it? I said, you never set the time on God. Rare exceptions. But I said, when you do, you're telling us you did. That's what faith's all about. I encourage people to ask questions, but I tell you, and I'm going to keep telling you, as long as the Lord permits me to be here in this pulpit, as long as you have to ask me questions about faith, it's not faith yet. Amen. Now, I encourage you to ask questions. I, I enjoy counseling people. I do it at church. I'll tell you right now. I, that's another story. Now, I'll stay here as long as you want to talk, and I do it all the time. I'm usually the last to leave. But I'm helping you now with faith. As long as you have to ask, will this work or can I do that? It's not faith yet. Faith makes a confession. Doubt asks a question. <laughs> Doubt says, what should I do? Faith says, here's what I've done. Well, you hear people jumping up here all the time saying, here's what I've done. But you don't hear what some are asking me up here. I'm not criticizing them. That's the way they learn. Amen. See, I'm not criticizing you for asking a question. I'm saying as long as you're asking, you're not believing yet. Should I take my glasses off? Hear that one all the time. <laughs> or I've had my eyes prayed for. Should I leave them off? I still can't see. Well, I say the reason is that you're not healed yet. <clears throat> You'll never be able to see as long as you're asking, should I leave my glasses off or put them on? One fellow tried it, but he said, I, gotta, I have to put them back on because he said, that's the way I earn my bread. I've got to see. The kind of work I'm in, I've got to see. <clears throat> He really does. He needs his glasses. <laughs> oh, I didn't say it wouldn't be a trial, friends. But I'm saying faith is I'll give up that job before I'll doubt. Amen. Now, I didn't say you have to take your glasses off. That's between you and how far you want to go with this healing bit. I just go all the way. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All the times when... When the old flesh wished it, that I had had those glasses back on. This book I'm writing now, about 400 pages, I guess. And I'll tell you. There are times, friends, when I just had to quit. I could not see another word. You, you have no idea the research. and the, the Why, sometimes you've had to deal with 13 books for just one thing you're dealing with in your book. And that sort of thing. But you see... When it's faith, you don't ask, what should you do? Or wouldn't it be easier to quit battling this thing and just get the job done? It'd been a lot easier if I'd have never taken them off several years ago. Yes, and I wouldn't have to tell you about it. <laughs> <clears throat> I could do like some do. They put them on to read the menu. They put them on to read their Bible. They put them on to do their studying. And they say, well, I'm 50 years old or I'm 55 years old. Your eyes get set. <laughs> You heard my answer to that one? If they get set completely, they call that death. <clears throat> so I'm not going to confess my eyes are getting set. That's just a part of the confession. I'm on the way down, not up. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I, I can see all right. You saw me reading this pretty poor light up here. But I'm saying, you know, that uh, 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 the research I've been doing and all by faith, it's amazing the size of that book, and I've read it all by faith. Uh, and worked hard. Uh, I get up, friends, if I start at 9 o'clock, I go to bed at 1, seven days a week. Not boasting or crying on your shoulder. That's just me. I, would, I, would, uh, I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I wasn't busy. <laughs> I, you know, if I, if I take a day off, I have to build a radio or something. <laughs> so I'm saying that I use my eyes probably more than, than any dozen of you out there and I've done it by faith so it does work and of course manifestations do come on this and that and the other we've all had manifestations of various things some have had their eyes healed and that sort of thing an instant manifestation or close to that <clears throat> 
And uh, I'm just saying this is how you want it. Uh, if you want to go all the way, and some of us have, then you won't need glasses. But if you're going to decide to go all the way, please don't ask questions, what should I do? Because that isn't faith. Because if you do, I'm going to answer you like I always answer that one. I'd, I always tell them they're not, you're not healed. It would be better for you to wear glasses or throw them away. You're not healed. Because as long as you're asking questions, like the woman that heard us teaching on faith for a couple of years, I didn't know she had diabetes. And <clears throat> one day after everyone had left in one of the meetings where we were, uh, she asked me to pray for her, and uh, she said, just lay your hand on my head, I'm healed of diabetes. That's all there was to it. <clears throat> she didn't say what she to do, should have thrown the insulin away or all. I don't know what she did. I didn't follow her around, but I do know a year later she stood and said, hey, can I give a testimony before you start speaking? She said, a year ago I was prayed for for diabetes, threw the medicine away. She said, I've, I was healed then, I'm still healed. See, there's faith giving a confession what I've done. <clears throat> she hadn't made that confession two weeks till a brother came into the same meeting. I know he didn't hear that because that's the first time I saw him. And same condition, I prayed for him. I had no sooner prayed for him. He said, now should I continue to take insulin? Well, I said, not unless you have diabetes. <laughs> now, I just prayed for his healing. <laughs> I said... <clears throat> Do you still have diabetes? He wasn't sure. He really wasn't. He couldn't answer. And I'd preached, you know, a real strong message on faith. If he'd really been listening, he would have seen that he shouldn't have asked the question. But I said, personally, I don't take insulin. Do you know why? I said, I don't have diabetes. I said, if I had diabetes, I would have to take insulin. You really would, friends. If you've got diabetes, you have to take insulin. That's true whether you believe in divine healing or not. If you've got diabetes, you have to take your insulin. Oh, you can have all the symptoms, and you can be prayed for and claim it and have all the symptoms, but you don't have diabetes. God said, believe you have received when you pray. But as long as you believe you have diabetes, you have to stay on insulin. I said, now the reason I don't take it, I don't have diabetes. I said, do you have it? Well, he wasn't sure, and he did because I saw him several months later, and he was just as close to being dead as you could imagine. I mean, he looked terrible. He still had his diabetes. Now, what I'm saying is, the difference between hope and faith is this. He was hoping he would get healed when I prayed. The woman made her own decision. She sat under the word for all those months and then said, now, when you pray, I'm healed. And she didn't say, should I throw my medicine away? Uh, she, she worked this out herself. And then a year later said, I'm still healed. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I, I never followed her around. I didn't uh, question her about it before or after either one of the confessions or testimonies. Faith makes a confession. Here's what I've done. Hope says, what should I do? It always raises a question, what should I do? Uh, when you believe you're saved, you'll confess it. Some people can't get saved because they're afraid to confess it. That is, they're waiting till they get some assurance or evidence. I prayed for a young man once, or he came for prayer, came for help who uh, said that uh, he would like to believe, but he couldn't. He said, I've tried this. I get no assurance, and so on and so forth. Well, I said, you're getting the cart before the horse. I said, you have to make the confession. Do the believing. Make the confession. I said, then the assurance will come. And then I gave him my experience. I said, I believed for two months before I felt saved. Uh, I don't want any of you here to have to go through what I went through the two months that I went through after I made a confession of faith in Christ. I suffered torment. I didn't know anything about demons and lying spirits. And, uh, the devil just gave me a hassle of 24 hours a day. You know, wake you up in the middle of the night and tell you you're not saved. Everybody can be saved but you. Well, I'd confess John 3.16, and after two months, God said to me, he said, son, you're saved because I said it, not because you feel like it. Amen. Well... A profound theological truth he gave me there in, in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. And so I said, all right, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to accept it because you said it and quit worrying about it. Well, as soon as I accepted it, then the assurance began to come. So I said to him, that's the same way with you. You're waiting to feel like you're saved. You want some inward assurance. It's good to have it, but I said, you know, there can be a hundred reasons why a person wouldn't have assurance about healing or anything else immediately. 
He just has to base it on the Word of God. So I had him make a confession of faith. I said, every time you think about it, praise God you're saved, praise God your sins are forgiven, thank God you have eternal life. That was a Saturday night where I prayed for him, led him to Christ, came to church Sunday morning. When he walked in the door, I said, are you still confessing it? I didn't say, how do you feel? I said, you still confessing it? Let's hear it. He made another confession of faith. I said, keep confessing it. Came, <clears throat> came that night, had him confess it again. Came Wednesday, I said, you still confessing it? You could tell he still didn't feel like he was saved, just by the look on his face person has the joy of the Lord, you don't have to ask them, hey, are you saved or baptized in the Holy Ghost? Uh, I said, you still confessing it? He confessed it again. That night going home, he still didn't feel a thing. The Holy Spirit fell on the car. He was baptized in spirit, began to speak in new tongues. Nobody prayed for him for the baptism. He just got his assurance in the car. <laughs> Amen. Only Christians are baptized in the spirit. So there was his assurance. He was saved four days and didn't feel like it. Simply because I said you are, but if you'll believe it, because God says you are. Say four days didn't feel like it. I'd been saved two months and suffered torment. Didn't feel like it. If you can be saved four days or two months without feeling like it, you can be healed for four days or two months without feeling. Because God says you are. You can have the money before you see it. You don't have to see the money before you have it. If God says you have it. What if he sends it from California? What if you pray for... Oh, you desperately need that $7,500. They're going to foreclose, or you've got to have it. You've made a deal. You've already made a down payment, you know. Money's going to come. What if God's going to touch somebody over in L.A., Christian over there has got a lot of money? How long does it take the mail? About a week to get from L.A. to, say, Claypool or Warsaw or North Manchester. And some people say, well, the deadline's Wednesday and it takes, you prayed Monday and it takes till Friday for the mail to get in. If you're going to hold God to the fact you haven't received because the deadline is Wednesday, well, you don't even give God time enough to deliver the mail. The money's in the mail. I mean, it's just that way, friends. It is just that way. You'd be surprised how some people give up. And so God, knowing what they will do doesn't bother to send the money because they're going to close the door. He can only get it in your door when you open it by faith. So he doesn't bother to send it. If you could see from his side, you miss the answer because, well, you know, uh, you close the door on God before he could manifest it. Uh, Begin to thank God when you see it. Do like that boy that we prayed for with the blind eyes. When you believe you have received, when it's no longer hope and it's faith in your heart, You're doing like him, praising God, confessing, thanking God you can see when everyone sees you can't see. Where did he get the idea? Jesus. John 11. Thank God for raising Lazarus while he was still dead and stinking in the tomb. He didn't say, I think I'll try this. Um, Roll the stone away and let's see just how bad he does stink. (laughs) Martha said, you know, he stinks. It's been four days. But you read John 11, and as he went to the tomb, he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. That's the only prayer he prayed to get Lazarus out of the grave. Amen. Amen. You talk about words and pray all the time. Well, he'd been praying. He prayed all night. Then he'd go speak a word of faith, you see. Amen. We're all for prayer. We're talking about when it comes time to act, act. It comes time to pray, then pray. Tell God what you want. That's the only prayer he prayed to get Lazarus out of the tomb, and that was a prayer of thanksgiving. I thank thee, Father, thou hast heard me, for thou always hearest me. And he went on to say, I don't even have to say that much, but I said it for their sake. The people round about, that when they heard me thank you for raising him while he's still dead and stinking in the tomb, they'll know that this is God. Oh, there's a lot in the Bible, friends, that you can learn about faith. Uh, Jesus said to me, he said, you, you start ministering. You get into the four Gospels, you start ministering the way I minister. And then wherever he sends me, you tell the people to minister the way they see you minister. Tell them to get in the Word. Because he said, I minister, said to me, I minister totally, ministered totally by faith. Amen. Totally by faith. Wow. Nothing would have happened except I believed it. He said, that's exactly... Oh, I'll tell you, I know a whole lot about faith. I've been walking by faith for 22 years, but I want to tell you, be presumptuous for me to say because I've read John 11 once that I know all about the raising of Lazarus. But I just told you some things that that probably all of you or most of you didn't know. 
that people get in a hassle sometimes because you say pray once, you pray ten times for the same promise you've prayed nine times in unbelief. And he didn't even pray a prayer to get Lazarus out of the tomb. Except for the benefit of those round about him that they might believe. And then it was just, thank you. What do you think would happen if you laid hands on that sick person and thank you, Father, it's done in Jesus' name? That'll do the job as quickly as five minutes of telling God you love him. And this brother or sister has been suffering for five years of this condition. Lord, you know how much we need this. And Lord, oh, demonstrate your power before the congregation. Well, I'm all for prayer. If you want to do it that way, go ahead. But I'm ministering in to 50 people while you're ministering to that one. Amen. And getting the same thing done. Amen. Pray, yes, pray. But do your praying before you do your saying. Pray and then say. Hallelujah. Amen. And if it's faith and not hope, you'll hold out uh, on those cases that you're praying about. You're going to hold out Amen. until the last minute. A woman said to me once, how long should I wait? She said, I believe it just like you teach it that you have to believe you have received. She said, I believe I have received. She says, I've been believing that for a year. <laughs> she said, Brother Freeman, I know it's right. Mark eleven twenty four, 24, just the way you teach it, but how long? I've been waiting a year. I need this. I said, till the last minute. <laughs> you think she jumped over any chairs? Big smile, no. Rather weak smile, she said, that's right. In fact, she, people often say, I know what you're going to say before I ask. <laughs> say, uh, they sometimes say, no point asking him how he is, you always get the same answer. Well, you know, you can be battling symptoms and say you're rejoicing in the Lord. But praise God, I said to the last minute, I said, that's the way it has to be. She said, I know it. Hallelujah. The last minute. Sometimes, friends, the last minute has come and gone. When I claimed that Jewish soul over in Israel in 1966, the last minute had come and gone. Down the Sea of Galilee, I'd claimed a Jew, a salvation of a Jew for that day, and the bus is up there racing the motor, the people are on the bus, all the others on the tour, you know, and they think I'm down there because I'm the official photographer. I'm down there taking pictures. I was the official photographer. That's my designation. I was the only one that knew anything about it. The rest of them had little Kodaks. And one other fellow had a movie camera, and he shot all of his out of the bus the first day. I shot 30 rows in three weeks. But um, they thought I was down there taking pictures. They were mad and upset and riled and... Oh, it was, it was way past the deadline for that bus to leave, and I'd been trying to get the tour guide converted all the way up from Jerusalem to, to uh, Tiberias, and then from Tiberias to Capernaum, where we were then, and oh, he was really turned off with me, and uh, we walked in a place to get a soft drink, and I always, uh, they called me the Cole Porter on that trip, because uh, I passed out tracks in Hebrew, and when is in Italy, and Italian, and uh, English where I could, and I'd throw them out of the bus, I'd leave them in motel rooms, I'd give them to the maids, and uh, left them in St. Peter's in Rome. You're not even allowed to carry literature in there, and I left a whole stack of tracts in Italian, how to be saved, right in St. Peter's. <clears throat> and so he saw me with these tracts in where we went to get a soft drink. He said, please, not here, not here, because it, it was kind of a, a beach nightclub -y thing, you know. Um, where everybody was guzzling beer and all that, and he, that would have been the last straw for him. <laughs> so he was there on the bus, and they all thought I was down there taking pictures, but I was witnessing that 17-year-old Jewish boy about Jesus, and he gave his heart to Jesus 30 minutes after the deadline. Because, see, if I'd have gone by the bus schedule, I'd have left him there and been on back. And the airport, you know, we, we left. That was the last day. But praise God, the last minute isn't the last minute. You ought to read Bevington sometime. He had some last minute answers. Sometimes God holds you to the last minute. Just to see if you're talking words. Hallelujah. Father, we pray that you'll teach us by the Spirit the difference between hoping and believing. But even more, that you'll help us to get on believing ground so that when we ask, and say that we believe that we've met the conditions 
and that everything is right, everything is favorable from our side. No hindrance to receiving an answer. And then to, to hold out until the last minute, knowing that you are faithful, if we will continue our confession, that you will be faithful to do what you promise. Let faith be our standard in this church. Let our faith be mixed with a, a, a true life of faith, a walk of faith, a doing of faith, a working out of that which we say we believe. Let there be a full rounded understanding of what faith requires and what it is. This morning we pray that as we, as we minister this word to the hearts, that the Spirit of God will make it real, make it living. Because if he doesn't do his ministry, Father, then words are just dead letters. But you've said that we can believe for this, and so we're believing for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon this word to nurture it and to bring forth fruit in every heart, <clears throat> some 30, 60, some 100 fold. And that needs will be met and that Jesus Christ will be proven to be true and true to his word just by the fact that having believed and having received, they will know that what you've said you will do. Bless this word to this end, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.